Now, uh, Pierre Legendre has presented you the grandmother of ordination methods, PCA. Before that golden times of pre-transformation, there was that concern about species. All ecologists wanted to compute ordinations because they already had realized the importance and the potential of those methods. At the beginning, uh, of course, uh, they were not aware of the double zero problem. And so they use PCA on raw species data, and they ended up with uh, sometimes quite absurd results. And some of them decided that, well, pff, PCA and the ordination altogether is not for species, so we'll resort to uh, other techniques, and they abandoned it uh, altogether. Uh, on the other hand, in the 60s, uh, some researchers became aware that other ordination methods may be interesting. And those among those, what is called correspondence analysis. Correspondence analysis has first been designed to analyze uh, tables, uh, contingency, uh, contingency tables. So actually, they are quite well devised to find the exceptional values in a table. Retain that because it, 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 uh, it is actually one of the features of correspondence analysis. So the reason that actually uh, a table of species or site by species data, which has absolute frequencies in it, like in any contingency table, could be considered a kind of very spe special contingency table where one variable would be, uh, be careful, it's not the way we interpret it now, but basically we consider, well, you could have a variable site with as many uh, levels as uh, you have sites, and another which would be species with any le uh, as many levels as you have species. So you have your table. And uh, you could analyze this by correspondence analysis. In such a computation, you have, in a, as you may probably know, when you compute uh, uh, chi-square stati uh, statistics on the, on the contingency table, you have those chi-square values um, in, the, in the cells of your contingency table. So actually, CA correspondence analysis is a form, is a PCA, but instead of computing the PCA on the raw values, you first transform your table in a, on a table of the contribution of all the cells to the chi-square. And then you submit that table to a, uh, uh, a PCA. So th this also means, by the way, that all the new values in the cells are weighted by the sites and by the species. You know, so you have actually a method that already embeds a transformation of species in such a way that it, the new distance that is respected among sites or among species, we'll see the details in a, in a moment, is actually the chi-square distance. And that chi-square distance does not consider the double zeros as a resemblance. The zeros don't count in the uh, computation of a chi-square value. As a consequence, CA is a method that at the outset, without any pre-transformation, is adapted to the analysis of species abundance data. In the document about the mathematics or the algebra of PCA, uh, if you go further down than Pierre Lejean uh, reached in a, a moment ago, you will find the al uh, algebra for correspondence analysis. Now I take a little step back <coughs> from the mathematical concept and take a minute to explain how I consider intuitively what an ordination does. What you have seen ma in mathematical terms when Pierre showed that to you, and what it does, of course, with the uh, mathematical uh, differences among those methods. But all those, PCA, CA, and principal coordinate analysis that I will address later, have in common to find 
in a cluster of points, which are the sites expressed in their, uh, the space of their variables, to find the orientation of an axis that maximizes its variance. Uh, you may not have noticed it on the small example of, uh, that Pierre showed you. Uh, at the beginning, the variances of the original variables were, if memory serves me well, 8.2 and 5.8. And, uh, well, you had, you had the, the covariances here which are not uh, relevant here. And when you put the data through that magical equation for uh, the extraction of eigenvalues, you ended up with eigenvalues which were 9 and 5, with the same total of 14. Now, 8.2, 5.8, 9, 5. It's as if a part of the information here had been transferred to the first axis, because this corresponds to the first and this to the second axis. We had only two in that small example. This is actually how all those methods of ordination work. Imagine, a, well, in our minds, we live in a three-dimensional, well, at least for the physical, uh, for the, the, the well, uh, X, Y, Z uh, part, we live in a three-dimensional world. In this world, we can figure out any cluster of points so imagine your data is a uh, cluster, your, 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 your sites expressed for three species or three, uh, any variables you deem appropriate here, uh, here in this room. So we have a cluster with, prob it's probably not completely spherical. Otherwise, you can't do anything because there is, a, actually, this, this would be the case where you have no information at all in, in your data. It would be completely random. But in, uh, of course, in, in, in the overwhelming cases, you have some information, meaning that some sites are expressed uh, in, in different, uh, the values of the variables are different from others, and you may end up with clusters, subclusters, or simply with a, cl a cluster that is elongated in some direction, which is probably a combination of those dimensions. PCA and the other two ordination methods actually look for the axis of that elongation, that greatest elongation, because this is the one that will maximize the variance. Maximizing the variance meaning you seek the direction where you have most information, because if the cluster is elongated, then here you see that there is information on, along that axis. It probably represents for us ecologists an ecological gradient expressed by physical chemical variables if you do a PCA on those variables, or expressed in terms of, of community composition if you are with, uh, with species data. So this is what the PCA does. It, it looks for that first elongation. And when it has found it, it will look for the second one, provided that it is orthogonal to the first one. Okay? So uh, let's imagine you have your first axis in that direction. Look for the second one, rotate actually, in our three-dimensional uh, world. It amounts to rotating the, the, the second possible axis, orthogonal to the first one, until you find the second elongated, uh, most important elongation in that axis. In the axis, you, you have the first axis here, you have looked at from that point of view, and then you go here, and you look how it is deformed in that dimension, and you, uh, and you look for the, the second one. And this one is, of course, of orthogonal, orthogonal. It has to be orthogonal to the first one. And it goes on. In three dimensions, you have only three. The rest of it uh, will be orthogonal to the two previous ones, and you have uh, your third dimi dimension. And each time, you see that you actually, the, the projection provides a shorter view of your data. And this corresponds to smaller and smaller amounts of variances. The amount of variance that you capture on the different axes is given by the eigenvalues. So you have the sum of those eigenvalues which give you the total amount of, var of variance and if you want to know the proportion of variance that is explained, or not explained, oh, oh no, forget that, that, that. At this point, we don't explain anything. We just represent uh, 
your data. But the first axis, the amount of variance that is expressed or represented on the first axis, is given by the eigenvalue of that axis divided by the sum of all eigenvalues. So, for instance, in one of his last examples, Pierre told you, I don't remember the figures, but that uh, the, the, the two first axes represented, I, I don't remember, maybe 30 or 40 percent of the variance of the data. This is actually what he did. He took the eigenvalues of the two first axes and sum them up and divide by the total number of, uh, of the total uh, sum of all eigenvalues or the total variance in the, in the case of PCA. And that gave him that amount. This is how he could tell you that this represented so and uh, so much variance. Okay, so for people who are more comfortable with such kind of representations, uh, I for one, I'm one of those. I need an intuitive understanding of that, what I'm doing. Something uh, that is maybe an analogy, but as close as possible to the real thing. You don't uh, deform that as, so as to, to have no uh, relationship with the mathematics. But it's another way uh, that I suggest for you to, to represent. And now, PCA do, does that in a strictly Euclidean world, except in the cases of pre-transformation, in, in the case of species data. Correspondence analysis does this in the world of the chi-square distance, which is not the, uh, a distance we are familiar with in, in our all day, uh, everyday uh, life. But in any case, consider this as any, uh, another type of space that is adequate in that case for species abundances. The consequence is that you do not pre-transform the species when you want to run a, uh, a correspondence analysis. You use the original raw values because the transformation is actually embedded in the method itself. It does it automatically. Uh, if you pre-transform maybe a Cord or Hellinger data to submit them to CA, you end up of some, uh, with something that is not interpretable. So don't superimpose uh, those two. Don't make a mix between the two. Okay? Either you use PCA and you pre-transform your species data, or you use them raw and you submit them to correspondence analysis. Does this give exactly the same result? The answer is no, because uh, uh, in, in, for several reasons, well, the, the closest pre-transformation that you could use would be the one that leads to the chi-square distance, which is actually the one preserved in, uh, in correspondence analysis. If you pre-transform using chi-square distance and run a PCA, you'll end up with something that, which is very close to correspondence analysis. Not exactly because CA has internal way of uh, working mathematically that weights uh, the, 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 well, the procedure has a, a little mathematical characteristic that are quite a little bit different. So the, the, the two results will not be exactly the same, but they will be very close. If you use other types of pre-transformation, maybe a chord or Hellinger distances before, uh, prior to PCA, then you may end up with results that may be a little bit different from those, but uh, equally valid. Now, what do you need to run correspondence analysis? I told you, I, I'm a practical, I, I'm the guy who uses the method and thinks about uh, how to use them uh, in an optimal way. So, you need dimensionally homogeneous variables, meaning you cannot take maybe your physical, um, chemical variables of all kinds with pH and, uh, and, and degrees and uh, uh, milligram per, well, anything. You cannot use them in uh, CA, in correspondence analysis. You have dimensionally homogeneous, which is, of course, the case with abundance data. And the, the, mini, the, the smallest value must be zero. You cannot have negative values in a CA. If you try, you simply uh, get a, an error message, and uh, it, it simply doesn't work. Because, I remind you, this is based on the analysis of a table of uh, frequencies. So frequencies, by definition, cannot be negative. Uh, for technical reasons that you may find in Pierre's document, CA actually produces one axis less than the minimum of the two dimensions of the, your data table, meaning if you have uh, 20 uh, sites and 10 species, 
you will end up with nine ordination axes. So we'll take the if the table had more species than, than sites, then it would be the minimum, uh, the, the number of sites minus one. So this is a technical point, but also the fact that it depends equally on the number of sites or uh, objects and the number of descriptors is also uh, a heritage from the contingency table thinking, which is completely symmetrical. As you, as you may remember, you can define uh, uh, the same uh, uh, contingency table this way or transpose it and we, you, you will end up with the same results. Here, um, you have that uh, characteristic in, inherited here. Okay, up to now? Understand? Fine. And now I'll have to introduce another of those points that is important. Pierre did not address that specific point in those terms, but he explained to you that there were two different ways of representing the results of a PCA. One that uh, emphasized, well, but that preserved actually the Euclidean distance among sites to the detriment of the, representing, uh, the representation of the, um, uh, of the variables. Those had a representation that did not correspond to their, uh, the angles did not correspond to their correlations. So we have the best representation uh, of sites, but the species, or well, if you have point transforms or the other variables, uh, were not optimally represented. This is called scaling one. So in uh, the analysis you are going to, to, to run for PCA and for correspondence, correspondence analysis, you will have that choice. You ask for, well, the analysis is done the same way, but it, when it comes to, uh, to, to, uh, to draw a biplot, then you have to choose between scaling one, which is the one preserving the distances among sites, and scaling two, which is the one preserving the distances among, oh, in PCA, the correlation among variables, which are represented as arrows, and in CA, as we will see, uh, the, the variables are, rep or specifically here, the species are also represented as points. So you have the, the two. <coughs> so same as in PCA, you ask for scaling one uh, if you are primarily interested in representing the ordination of objects on the basis of sites, uh, or, or on the basis of, uh, of species, sorry. Uh, technically, this means the objects are at the, at the centroids of the species. I'll show you graphical examples, and you, see, you will see how this uh, actually uh, uh, looks like. Uh, yeah. So the chi-square distance which is at the core of the correspondence analysis method, is preserved among objects. Uh, for that scaling one, how do you interpret it? The distance among objects in the reduced space approximate the chi-squared distance. Why do they approximate? Simply because you don't see all the dimensions. Uh, in your, in your biplot, you have two dimensions. If you had the... 15 axes, you, you just see part of the, re, the, the, the full ordination, of course. So this is an approximation. But thanks to the fact that CA as well as PCA extract the most important part of the variance on the first few axes, if you check that you have an, uh, an, a good amount of variance represented on those axes, you are confident that those main features that you see on the may, maybe the first plane, the, the one by two plane, these re represent the, re the main relationship among your sites quite well. So points that are close to one another in this graph uh, are likely to be similar <coughs> in their species relative frequencies. Always think uh, contingency table thinking if you are familiar with that. So. Conversely, any object that is found near the point representing a species is likely to have a high contribution of that species, meaning that you have uh, that species is probably quite abundant in that object. Or if you are in present absence, it's likely that if you have a site point close to a species point, then the species is probably present in that site. 
And here I have also a small example for that. In my, uh, by the way, I started my PowerPoint presentation at slide uh, 36. Why? Because all the first part, the, 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 the first part of my uh, presentation concerns what Pierre has shown you before. But of course, presented in my way, so we have complementary ways. And if you are interested to see the PCA presented in, in, in that type of, uh, of, of style that I'm presenting you the other method, you're free to go uh, to that other part of my documentation, which I left in these, uh, in these uh, slides uh, for you. OK, so now we have uh, the smallest possible example. Uh, you, you need at least three dimensions for the, the, the or, or, well, three uh, items, either three variables or three objects, because this will end up in CA with two dimensions. As, as I told you, you lose one for mathematical reasons. Anyway, so here you have those objects and the three species. This is the uh, result for scaling one that you have, uh, that I have obtained. And you may see, although it's not obvious, I'll take, I, I'll go from one to other, so uh, nobody's jealous of the, the other part of, oh, maybe to avoid that tomorrow morning everybody piles up there and there's nobody here. Uh, so you may see lambda one here, 0 0.23 rounded, and lambda 2, 0 0.085 on uh, 0.9. Okay, these are already uh, values that are reported uh, in, uh, in proportion to 1, or are they? Oh, no. No, they are not. No, they are not. In this case, they are raw values. So I'll, to, to assess the proportion of variance, or in this specific case in CA, you don't speak about variance. It's not true variance. It's a quantity called inertia. I have a, a slide for that. So, uh, but anyway, if you, have, if you sum up these uh, lambda values, you'll get the total inertia. And in the same way as in CA, you divide this value by the total to get the proportion represented by the first and by the second axis. And what you can see here in terms of interpretation, for instance, in uh, this uh, situation, you have objects four and five here, which are quite close to one another, relatively close, because they have all species in common in relative frequency, frequencies that are comparable, not completely the same, but they are still comparable. And for instance, uh, species three is at approximately the same distance between objects uh, of, of objects four and five. This is this species because, again, in terms of uh, relative uh, representation, is quite close, maybe a little bit more to uh, object four than five. Uh, but in any case, uh, since, since it is also represented elsewhere, it has been also placed uh, accounting for all those uh, different relative frequencies. But then you, be, you could be quite sure that uh, just looking at this, that species three is present in quite an amount in those sites and uh, absent or in, uh, in uh, smaller abundances in the other sites here. Uh, a word maybe here about object number two. Objects that end up close to the origin of a biplot are always tricky to interpret. Because, and this is specific, uh, especially, especially the case in CA, you may have two different si at least two different situations that could end up here in such, a, in such a situation. The most likely one is that this object is something like uh, contains an equal representation of all the variables or most of the important variables, which is the case here. You see that uh, the three species are present in abundances that are quite close to one another. So this object does not distinguish itself uh, uh, going, uh, and, and, and uh, therefore it's not projected in, in one of the uh, corners of the uh, biplot here. The, it's close to the center. Another possibility, for instance, for x1, would be the unlikely uh, case that a species would be present uh, here and here, so in the opposite corners, which would also end up of uh, the sites being present in the, in the, in the middle. So b always be careful. Usually, uh, objects uh, that are close to the center are 
average objects, meaning that uh, you have a relatively balanced uh, representation of the variables in, uh, in the object. Uh, well, of course, you could continue here. So this is another uh, representation, a real case here, again with the uh, oribatid mite data that I have collected with uh, my wife in 89 during my postdoc fellowship in Pierre Lejeune's lab. And I told you that in scaling one, we had uh, the sites presented at the uh, centroids of, or uh, weighted centroids actually, of species. So you have the species all around here, and each site here is actually a weighted average of its, 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 uh, its projected at the weighted average of abundance of uh, all the species. So you, you take the species uh, scores, as we, as we call them, the coordinates of the species on the, on the axis, and you take, uh, you weight those coordinates according to the relative uh, frequency of the species, a little bit technical, and you obtain those points here. So uh, since it's scaling one, it, the, the, the chi-square distance among sites is preserved, but not the chi-square distance among species. But species can, of course, be interpreted in terms of their uh, abundances within sites. So you have the sites here, and this group of sites is likely to contain many uh, of those uh, species here, for instance. And of course, oppositely, I mean, uh, probably expect that sites on this side of the ordination by plot do not contain any uh, of those uh, species here. Okay? Fine. Now, you have the other scaling, which is the type 2, where it is the species, so the columns, that are the centroids of rows. So it's op the opposite. So it's uh, the scaling to choose if you are mainly interested in the ordination of species. For instance, if you want to see if you can delineate species association or, well, uh, assemblages uh, within your ordination graph, that would be the way to go in CA using scaling 2. And the chi-square distance is, present, uh, is preserved among variables, meaning here among species. So in terms of interpretation, the distance among species in, uh, in the reduced space, reduced space means simply that you see only two axes at a time, okay? It's that. Uh, uh, approximate the chi-square distance for the same reason as with the sites. So species points that are close to another are likely to be represented in uh, relatively similar relative frequencies in, in, in sites. And any species lying close to uh, a uh, point representing an object is more likely to be found in that object. So this is the same ordination as before, but this time in scaling two. So now you see that instead of having, I go back here, instead of having your species at the periphery here and the objects at the centroid of the species, you have now the reverse uh, here. So the objects are here all around and the species are here. But this representation optimizes the, re the, the, the representation of species. Of course, this is but a small example, so, so there's not very much to be said about the, the relationships, and it's an artificial one and, and that. But for instance, species two and three here uh, are at a given distance here. Uh, species two, species three, as you, as you may see, they are, uh, on the first axis, they are almost well, uh, there's almost a continuum. You can also try and uh, interpret axis by axis the, those ordinations. So here, for instance, it's, it's also true for the PCA uh, by scaling one. You can see the, 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 the gradients that had been extracted axis by axis, uh, the, the gradient on the first axis. Uh, those axes are sometimes called latent variables, meaning that you have a combination of variables representing a complex ecological gradient, and this ends up being represented in the one ordination axis, the first, and then the second one, and so on. So here, for instance, on the first axis, you see that continuum between species one, two, and three, uh, according to the way they are uh, more abundant in objects uh, three and six for species one. Uh, if you look them here and uh, here, well, you have also here in object two, uh, species one is quite well represented as well, and uh, then you go to species two here, which is quite in the middle here for uh, the first axis and the first gradient, but uh, which is more 
separated in, on the second axis, the second most important features present in the data as being closer to object one, for instance, than to the other ones. So of course, if you have, uh, if you have uh, uh, more complex situations, like here, for instance, this is again my oribatidmite data, but in scaling two. So we, now you see also the, the reverse with uh, representation, the opposite uh, situation where, where you have the sites uh, that are plotted here at the periphery and the species that they are centroid here. So uh, here is uh, the representation. Although it's difficult to find out groups or delineate uh, groups of, uh, of species here, uh, in some cases, it's, it's clearer. In some other data sets, you may find that, uh, well, groups of sites may be here and another one here and another one here. You may have some of those concentrations here, but they are not extremely obvious. Remember that ordination is made to, uh, to show you continuums. Ecology is about continuity. I mean, it's, of course, in special cases, you may have, you may have ruptures. Uh, clear-cut situations where on one side you have a community and on the other you have something fully different. But in those cases, uh, it, generally this is a trivial separation. So instead of wasting axes showing what you already know, uh, you are uh, likely to uh, run separate analysis on the two groups because they are obviously separated if you, uh, if you try and, uh, and analyze uh, uh, a real uh, case situation where you have uh, uh, one group of species, vegetation, for instance, in the forest, and the other one on a dry, uh, on a dry soil without uh, trees and uh, just about a little bit of vegetation. You already know that this is different, so you don't know, uh, need an ordination to show you that. But the structure within would be interesting to to show in an ordination. So, of course, such an extreme case would end up with groups of sites and species completely separated on the first axis. Okay, that would end up in the opposite directions. And that would be true uh, uh, as well with PCA, with pre-transformation. Okay? No question? Fine. Now, attractive as they are, those methods have their shortcomings. Nothing is perfect in this. You have already discovered that you don't have an optimal display of both species and sites. You have to choose between scaling one and two. So this is one of those shortcomings. But there are others. And for CA, since I'm now in CA, I have, if you look back at the slides, I have some words of caution about PCA as well, uh, limits what you should do or not, the uses and misuses of, of PCA. Uh, uh, here for CA, well, uh, since it is based on a contingency table thinking, you know, when you, when you run a contingency uh, like I-square test, what you are actually looking for is special cases, extreme cases, because the, those are the ones that will most contribute to the chi-square statistic and uh, bring it over uh, the critical value for your test. And actually, correspondence analysis reflects this uh, specialty in uh, throwing away uh, in, in, in uh, large distances uh, the, 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 the cases that are very special. And special cases in ecology mean, for instance, very rare species. Rare in the sense that you don't find them in many sites. If they are extremely rare and, you, uh, and uh, find, found just in one or two sites, and on the top of it just an, as one or two uh, specimens, well, you may have to think if you really need those in your ordination because at least graphically, they, they, they won't uh, influence the, the, the eigenvalue very much because very rare species and uh, with uh, low abundances do not contribute to, to high to, uh, high to the, the, the inertia or the variance, if you, if you want. But they will graphically uh, produce points that are extreme, and by contrast, uh, everything else will be bunched at the center of your ordination graph and, uh, and uh, not very legible. So, uh, well, 
in some cases, I, I, I tend to filter out everything that is the present in less than, uh, than a given percent of the sites, or in one or two sites. It could be also something like that. Well, be careful about that. So uh, this is all of question of asking whether, again, this is meaningful information. When you have sporadic species occurring, it happens to be in one or of the other site, in any case, it's extremely difficult to find uh, meaningful ecological information about this. This occurs less in plants which are less likely to uh, run away and uh, wander around, except maybe for the ants in a lot of the rings that you may have seen, uh, where you have trees that wander around. But for the rest of the, 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 the practical day situ uh, all day situ situations, it doesn't likely occur. But for insects, for instance, or other uh, mobile species, it may happen quite often that you have accidentally captured one species that has nothing to do here. It just happened to go there and had, uh, uh, was unlucky, unlucky enough to fall into your trap, but actually it was not its destination. It wanted to, 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 to pass there. So think about that uh, in, uh, in the case of CA especially. especially. Because uh, PCA is less prone to that, that kind of, uh, of behavior. It will end up with a very short arrow, and it will not disturb you anyway. But another point is important about CA. It is also with PCA, I'll come to the comparison in a moment, but it's generally uh, presented in the case of CA because it's there that it uh, generated most discussions uh, among the ecologists. And this is called the, 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 the phenomenon of the arch effect. CA and uh, the inventor of, canon of correspond uh, canonical correspondence analysis, which is the, 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 the constrained one that we, you will see later on in this course, uh, uh, brings up gradients that can be well interpreted in terms of the species packing model. I mean, the model that uh, predicts that species are organized among Ecolo uh, along ecological gradients in such a way that uh, every species has its optimum with a given tolerance ar around the, the optimum. So this may be an extreme case, uh, an artificial one, of course, that I have presented here. But a consequence of this in the, uh, so, so those species have uh, the so-called unimodal uh, distributions and CA is well suited to represent this because it projects uh, the species at the, at the the optimum along the ecological gradients represented by the ordination axis. So uh, this is all well and, and, and beautiful. But then how on earth, with a simple gradient like this, do you end up with a representing, uh, representation like the, this one at left? People usually scream and say this is a mathematical artifact and CA is not good because it produces such a thing. It's not. As long as you consider this as an artifact, you are stuck with the, you, you cannot understand what's happening. Actually, it's the only way the poor method has to represent what you are asking it to represent. Let's have a look at this model, uh, this packing model. Let's start at the, uh, say at the, around the center here. You have a species with the uh, optimum here, and another one optimum here and, and here, and the same on the other side. Those ones have sites in common. You, 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 here, the first one, for instance, is less abundant on, on that side, but it's still here. And it shares that sites with some of the species that are around it along the ecological gradient. Okay, So these are common. Of course, a way, if you, if you sample along long gradients, which is very often the, the case, arrives a point where this species is not found in common with another one which is here. Okay. So this is a case where you would have a, a, zero, a, a presence for, for that in, the, in this site, an absence here, and the opposite for the other species. It's not the double zero here, the problem is the, the problem of the presence of one species here and the other one. So this species and the second and the third and the fourth, they are progressively different in terms of their representation among the sites, up to the point where they simply do not share the uh, sites together. Okay. So all is well up to now. But if you see the same effect on the other side, which is, of course, the case, you will end up with situations where species cease to be to share common sites here and there and all the regions here at the extremes. 
So technically, the distance between this and this is maximum. It could not be larger from this and this and this and this species. They are more extreme, but you have the double zeros, and then they have their distribution among, among a series of sites on the other side. So once they do not share anything at all, they are completely different in, in terms of representation in the sites. So you are at the, the maximum possible. Ugh. But meanwhile, these species continue to be progressively more different from this and this and this. So if you consider it from the point of view of uh, the maximum possible distance, this tops off at the point where they, share, uh, they are not shared by, by any pairs of sites. But locally, here and on the other side, they continue to become progressively different. So how would you represent those two contradictory uh, notions or geometric situation in one single axis? It's just not possible. So the answer of correspondence analysis is to combine. Sorry, Pierre, I hope I did not destroy your, uh, 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 your mouse, otherwise <laughs> doesn't seem to be very serious. Anyway, uh, so you see. The two realities are represented by the two axes. The first one, if you project the sites, you have, uh, although here I have many sites, so it's not extremely well, uh, you cannot see it very well, but uh, if, you, if you take a, a one out of three or four sites, you will see that the distances between those will progressively decrease if you project here. It's going vertical here, so uh, distance between this site and say this one is very small here, while uh, three sites away, uh, sites away here, it's larger. Okay, it's because, so this is the first reality. You tend to have to go to the vertical uh, representation here because sites become progressively different from those here, and uh, they cannot be much different from one another when they, they reach the point where they have no uh, uh, species in common. So. This is the one reality. And the other is represented on the second axis. So they continue to become progressively different because they, uh, they are close to one another. Uh, the, the sites along the, 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 the gradient continue to be close to one another uh, on that uh, uh, closer relationship. So it's not an artifact. In PCA, the situation is, is even worse. Worse, even it, uh, if it's uh, more beautiful in terms of uh, graphical representation. Why on earth is it possible that those sides that are most extreme come together here? A clue here, this is done with species data without pre-transformation. Now, I ask you, how is that possible that those extremely different sites that have no species in common or almost no species in common uh, end up being closer to one another than uh, uh, other pairs of sites here? The double, zero. the double zero effect. Exactly. When you have less and less species in common, you have more and more double zeros in common. And these tend to put those sites together. Okay? So an un uh, well, a PCA run on species data without having pre-transformed those data ends up in such a representation which is completely away from uh, the reality in that case. While in CA, at least, you have a limited effect there. As I told you, for quite a time, this has been considered as an artifact. And people have tried to correct it and especially, they tried to correct it by a method called detrended correspondence analysis, meaning that by segment here, you take the sides here, and you put them into zero. So you, 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 you put it straight, so that as to, real, of course, in the real world, you have dispersion around there. But you would take a, a portion here, segments, uh, along the first axis, and put the mean equal to zero, and then represent all the thing here. This is called DCA, the Detrended Correspondence Analysis. Uh, but since you are trying to correct something that is not an artifact, it's actually useless, despite the fact that many people still tend to use it for whatever reason. 
it has been rejected for many reasons that I, I don't have time uh, here to, to, to present those reasons, but there's no real reason to use that detrended correspondence analysis because even with the geometrical fiddling here, uh, the second axis is meaningless. You, you cannot use it. So remember that. Better have uh, honest represent not uh, detrended representation that way and locally interpret the concentrations of sites or species as I showed you before here, then trying to redress something here that was not an artifact in the first place and end up with something that is completely useless in terms of ecological representation. Oh. Energy, basic resource in ecology. <laughs> Apparently, it's coming short for some people. I understand that fully. Okay, for CA, Fine. So now, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry when uh, when um, we work on uh, the French in the, the PCA, it, uh, when, uh, when you work with? Uh, data before, uh, okay, the, yes, the transformations. Well, you still have an arc effect, but not uh, the, the horseshoe, which is really the worst situation, yes. Well, you can try and make tries. Maybe in extreme effects, you will still have some residual horseshoe uh, effects. In uh, I don't remember having seen it in any way. It's well uh, corrected. Uh, well, you may have a little bit, a little rest of it in, in some of the transformation with some data. I remember having seen or tried and ended up with something like that, but it's by far not as extreme. I think in your paper you had something like that, Pierre. Uh, about the transformations. You should look up the, the, the paper and see about, uh, in the figures, but I think uh, we have something like that. But it's by far not, uh, not so extreme. No. Other, yes? Well, points near zero always mean that for a given reason, so General, in the most general case, points that are near the origin are average in terms of uh, the variables. So uh, they have no extreme abundance on any species, or if, if they are, uh, in the case of PCA, they have no extreme values in the environment, environmental variables. All those environmental variables would have quite, uh, well, uh, values close to their uh, mean to the arithmetic average with that. So th that makes them difficult to interpret because in some particular cases it may be also the compromise between the fact that they are extreme on one and the other variable that are opposite to one another in the graph. And they, in, in that case they would end up close to the, the middle as well. So always be careful about the interpretation of, uh, of points in the middle of the ordination. Of course, that's a good point. Of course, it's always possible that a point is close to the origin on the two first axes, but if you draw the third one, it happens to be very far away. Yes, yes, you have understood that. Uh, we usually show the two first axes first uh, because obviously they are representing the most of the, most of the variation, but the third and possibly even the fourth may be interesting. In such case, it's customary to, to, to keep the first one and as a basis and then go into the first by three and first by fourth uh, axis to uh, always uh, have the, the main trend as a reference. But yes, you're right, you can do that. Pierre uh, showed a, a double presentation where, where, where we, he showed first by second and first by third axis. Yes, excellent remark. Okay, now I have a couple of minutes left to present the principal coordinate analysis. This, uh, well, up to now we have PCA with Euclidean distance, and now, of course, those pre-transformations that allow, opens it up to a couple of others, but not many, actually. Only those that have a, a Euclidean component embedded in, in them, so core distance, uh, Euclidean, Hellinger distance, chi-square distance, and so on, so the five of them. And then you have the choice of CA with the chi-square distance. It can be that, for different reasons, you are interested to produce an ordination based on another type of distance. 
as I said, community ecologists among you may be familiar with the so-called uh, break artist distance, which is uh, often used in community ecology. So break artists cannot be, uh, you, uh, is not respected in any of the flavors of the two ordinations that I have shown you. Other situation may call for uh, more exotic distances or dissimilarities in general terms. For instance, when you have a set of uh, variables that are not only not expressed in the same units, but some of them are qualitative, some semi-quantitative, ordinal, and other ones quantitative. So how do you put them all together? There are some specialized dissimilarity measures that can cope with that kind of data. Uh, Gower distance or uh, uh, <coughs> it says Estabrook-Rogers. <laughs> okay, Estabrook-Rogers distance are, are such examples. How do you do that? Could you still produce an ordination? The, the answer is yes, thanks to principal coordinate analysis. This is what it does. It takes not the raw data, but already the square symmetrical matrix of dissimilarities and produces an ordination from that. As a consequence, of course, since your dissimilarity matrix is among sites, in most cases, what, what we call a Q mode is that you have the, the sites compared in terms of their variables, so you have only dissimilarities among sites in this matrix. The variables have disappeared altogether. So the ordination produces only an ordination of sites. If you use uh, other dissimilarity measures devoted to variables instead of sites, it's called the R mode. And then you would have only the variables represented on, on the ordination. But in both cases, well, uh, no, not in both cases, but in case you have a dissimilarity ma matrix among sites, which is uh, the most frequent situation, you can still afterwards, a posteriori, project the values of the variables in the ordination plot. So PCOA, the principal co uh, coordinate analysis, not to be confused with co uh, principal component analysis shown before by Pierre, uh, will end up with the same result as PCA if your matrix or your dissimilarity matrix is made of Euclidean distances. So uh, this shows simply that it, it works correctly. I mean, it, it takes the representation you give it and it uh, runs an ordination in, in an appropriate way. And in the case where you have more exotic of those, including the break artist distance or, um, or dissimilarity, uh, those have some geometrical properties that are difficult to cope with by, by an ordination method because uh, they are not fully representable in a Euclidean space. As a consequence, you get something very curious, and this is negative eigenvalues. I told uh, before that eigenvalues were the result of a partition of the variance among the, the axes, but there you have negative axes simply because some of the variance cannot be represented in real axes for some dissimilarity measures. This can be corrected uh, mathematically by a transformation again uh, of, uh, of, the, of the point, but this goes a little bit beyond what I want to show you today. The principle is this one. So for the six objects and the three uh, species that uh, well, I have shown you before, uh, you would obtain something like this here uh, if I run a principle coordinate analysis based on what most people know as break artists, but actually should be known as pre percentage difference uh, dissimilarity. So again here, you uh, can interpret, the, this is like a representation in, uh, in scaling one, wh what you get in this case. So you uh, can uh, interpret this in terms of distances uh, on, the, uh, on the ordination plot here. For the uh, oribatid mite data, it would give you this, so you have actually a scaling, uh, uh, you have uh, the, 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 the way, uh, you have the sites represented here, and you can represent the variables in two different ways. E, on, on the, one, the one hand, you can think of it in terms of weighted averages, like in CA. So you say, OK, there are such uh, so and so many uh, of these species in these sites. And if you, if you average the scores of these 
uh, where, where this uh, species is present and multiplying each scores by the abundance of the species, you end up with a point here. Well, in a very simple case, if you had, for instance, a species that was present only in sites 38 and 67 here in equal amounts, it would end up just here in the middle of, uh, of a line uh, connecting the two points. Okay, this is, and, if the, uh, and in terms of weighted average, if uh, the, the species had more, had a, yes, a high abundance in uh, 67 than in 38, that uh, it would be, end up closer here between the two sides, closer to uh, 67. So this is a principle. This is one way, but not, in, to my idea, not entirely satisfactory. Another way of doing it is consider the axes as some kind of uh, summary uh, of quantitative assessment of the uh, organization of the sites. And then you try to correlate the variables to these axes. And you uh, use this information. Here I have presented it on another data set to be uh, also uh, uh, faithful to that other data set. It's the do fish data set that you will use. Also, it's used in most of the chapters of the yellow book here, uh, orange book. So uh, for these 30 sites in the do data sets, you, uh, here I have projected the species as arrows. So this is a kind of PCA thinking. Okay? I have run the, uh, the PCA on the do fish data, and I, may, I should have uh, added here that it has also been run with, uh, 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 I think, with a percentage difference of break Curtis distance. And um, the, the species are simply, you, you correlate the abundance of the species with the scores of the sites. Okay, and you end up with a correlation that is positive or negative depending on the orientation. Yes, Pierre uh, not has told you that uh, during the computation of, a, uh, of an ordination, the orientation of the axis is arbitrary. There is an arbitrary decision of a uh, plus or minus at some point in the computation. So this or a mirror image in two axes would be equally uh, valid. There is no point about that. But okay, in this case, you end up with those uh, arrows uh, that can be interpreted uh, like in a, in a PCA uh, uh, ordination score, uh, where you have, uh, uh, in, the, in this case, uh, you know that these sites uh, have more abundance, uh, or higher abundance for this uh, species of fish, and so on and so forth. Uh, all, almost finished. Was I supposed to finish at 12.30? Yes. yes. So, okay, if you allow me a couple of more seconds just to... Uh, finish. So principal co uh, coordinate analysis can be used as it is, as I showed you here, but it is also used as an intermediate technical step in more complex analysis. It will be especially the case in day five when we present uh, uh, distance-based more, more, more and eigenvector maps in the uh, context of a spatial analysis where we will use uh, principal coordinate analysis. So to summary everything that has been shown you uh, this morning in terms of ordination, uh, I present you here uh, a graph, a figure by uh, Pierre. So what we have seen is first the classical approach with raw data and uh, PCA. In case of short gradients, you could use here, if, you, if we, we speak of species data, if the gradients are really short and you don't have much of those zeros and double zeros, you could use PCA. But uh, be the gradient short or long, you can use CA. And you end up with uh, an ordination plot of the, of the kinds I have shown you. You can, of course, transform the species, as I showed you. And this gives the TBPCA, so transformation-based approach here. That was the first part of my talk. Uh, about the transformation. And finally, the distance-based approach where you start with a dissimilarity matrix. This is PCOA, which was my last uh, part here. And as you will see uh, later in the course, the equivalent will be here uh, available for the constrained ordinations, which combine uh, uh, response data and exploratory, uh, explanatory data. Uh, for, for those different methods. But this is another story. Okay, thank you. So uh, I guess we all have uh, uh, merited our dinner, our lunch. So uh, let's proceed to that. Very yeah, very short. <laughs>
<laughs> Pierre is laughing. <laughs> we were expecting that question. Because, well, okay, we did not uh, present uh, non-metric multidimensional scaling because actually it's not an eigenvalue-based method. It's not linear. It's, it represents uh, some kind of a, well, how can I put this? A rough ordination, uh, but, well, the only use may, may be in special cases where you really need absolutely to represent some part of the variability in a restricted number of axes that are pre-imposed. I mean, you, you need two or you need only three and not more. But then, at the price of a complete deformation of the structure, which is not, uh, it's, it tries to respect the rank order of the, of the sites on, on the representation, but with more or less success, uh, this being represented by uh, so-called so, so uh, stress factor. Pierre, maybe you want to, yes? Yes, we have a slide with a comparison. Because in all cases where you would need that, you could probably use a PCOA, so a principal uh, coordinate analysis. And yes, we have a slide with a, with a comparison of those. Okay? Fine, so uh, bon appétit. <laughs> <laughs>